Dr. Brad, welcome to the Tick Bootcamp Podcast. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. I've really been looking forward to this. I think this is going to be a fun interview. Yes, I, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a fun interview, and I'm sure this is going to um, be fruitful for the folks in our community who, um, who have been excited for us to have you on the podcast. So uh, we're uh, really, really looking forward to this as well. So, so Dr. Brad, why don't you first give us a little bit about your background? Where are you currently calling in from, and what do you do professionally? I'm in uh, North Carolina, Asheville's general area, but not in the, in the town there. Uh, I'm a functional medicine doc. I've been a veteran functional medicine doctor. I've been doing this for almost 40 years now. An, an interesting thing about my own life, the Lord keeps putting the most difficult things into my pathway to have to deal with, figure out, and all that. And I, I started getting chronic illness problems when I was probably about five years old, woke up with just gut-wrenching pain. Uh, I ended up going to the hospital the first time in my life. And I, I ran into something with that that I think everybody can really identify with. Um, is Even though I was young age, I've always had one of those very inquisitive minds. And all, all you get is uh, a generic idea about what's going on here, take this, and you do better. No idea about what's a mechanism, what caused this, how do you manage your life with to not have these kinds of things anymore. And the Lord's just done so many, yeah, I, I've got so many hats, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, so, so let's talk about some of those hats, though. So you did you grow up in the same community where you're living now, or did you grow up in a different part of the country? No, I, I grew up in the West Coast, San Francisco Bay Area, um, <clears throat> pretty close to that area. Uh, teens were in the in the 70s, so not a lot I, I haven't seen in life. Um, moved from there to the Midwest. Lived so how long were you there, though, before, before you left the West Coast, or at least the San Francisco Bay Area? How long did you live there, and what was your childhood like during that window of time? Uh, I was, I, I think it was about 26 when I left there. Okay. Outdoor kid, uh, how many ticks I picked up in my lifetime, I couldn't tell you. We had an old woodsman teach some of my brothers how to remove ticks. And, and you know, the best way to remove a tick, good place to bring this up, is you get a pair of tweezers with a, with a point on them. Get some of those twist ties that you get off baggies, and you you tighten that up around the waist of the the uh, the tweezers, and use that as a clamp. You st stick the tweezers onto a tick, and you slide that clamp down so it holds the tick. You're not squeezing it; you're just holding it. You unscrew them. They come out every time. They come out alive. You don't implode the insides inside of you, which is a large part of what gets people sick. Embedded heads are imploding the guts inside of them. So, you know, I, I've pulled hundreds of ticks off. We raised horses for quite a, quite a few years. And uh, how many I've pulled off myself, I have no idea. Absolutely no idea at all. But I was an outdoor kid, always in the woods, always hunting, always checking things out, fishing and, and different things along that line. So uh, so you shared with us that you began to suffer from chronic illnesses as, as early as five years old. Right. Um, so when you when you were when you were having these experiences as a child, was there any thought that there was a connection between the chronic illnesses that, that were beginning to develop in, in you and um, your outdoorsy life and contact with uh, ticks? Well, actually, um, something else preceded that because <clears throat> it didn't seem that the gut issues that I was having would have been associated with the tick. Um, and I I found out what caused that later on. I I broke my first bicycle in two at five years of age, snapped it in two off, off the, uh, at the gooseneck. 
you know, where the forks, forks go in. <clears throat> and it was about two weeks later when that started. My wife, my mom re remembered that and I go, okay, that's probably what it is. Cause I got some growth plate injuries in my low back and my neck. And that probably set up a neurological thing for that later. We went on a vacation and I, I got a weird sickness where I felt like I had the flu 24-7, 365 days out of the year. And my whole world was spinning like a top. Vertigo was How really old were you then? Bad. Maybe seven. Okay. Maybe seven. And at that time, I, I started uh, I started cooking when I was a really young age. Uh, at seven, I started really ramped that up quite a bit because I realized if I ate different than the rest of the family, I felt different. And I started experimenting with my own lifestyle so that I could actually function at between five and seven years of age. Um, I've had people try and talk me into opening up a restaurant uh, since I was a teenager I, you know, I cook multiple ethnicities. It's all off the top of my head. I'm a mood cooker and, and you just, I don't use re recipes and, you know, I, I do a whole bunch of things, but that started this journey of experimenting with the way I lived with the way that I felt. And it was a huge eye opener. Um, if I ate the way the rest of my family ate, my, my, my world was rocked. And and this went on for years. How many? I don't know. It it was a rare day when I felt what most people would call normal. And I started managing that between five and seven years of age with with my own diet, with what I could scrounge out of the refrigerator. When I moved out of the house, I was told my mom cried for three days. And I said, that's just because nobody was left to clear out all the leftovers out of the refrigerator and make <laughs> soups and stews. <laughs> and she just kind of giggled about that. But, um, you know, that, that was that was probably the big start from all that. And I got into construction when I was uh, got out of high school early got into construction and um, the Lord, he chased me out of that after uh, quite a few years and kicked me out of, out of that, told me to go back to school, which I hated. I mean, I, I despise school. I just can't stand it to, to get into a doctorate program. And that led me into doing what I'm doing now. And we've just, he's always drawn the most ridiculously difficult cases to me that no one can help and we've got i think last year we had six people with uh, under the care of some of the most prestigious medical institutions in the world uh long-term care not getting any better and we we gave every one of them their life back in a short period of time and that's that's been our history. I, I looked at that a while back, and I, it, you know, it, to me, this is a humbling thing. It's not a braggart thing. It's a humbling thing that in close to 40 years, every time we've shared a patient with even the most prestigious of medical institutions, we beat them in diagnostics, we beat them in care, and we beat them in resolution of whatever people have every single time for close to 40 years wow that's really cool but let's let's before we get there because that, that is an exciting part of 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 your journey i'd like to sort of build out a little bit more um of, of your pre uh, medical career right so two things that that i think are interesting that i'd like to revisit with you first when you you said during your childhood you were an outdoorsy kid and um, you had ticks on you all the time. And, and a, uh, did you call it a woodsman or an outdoors person taught you how to remove ticks? Um, yeah, yeah, he was a, a woodsman. He was actually part of Al Capone's gang. And he, he went out in the woods hiding out from the gang. And he was one of the most creative guys you'll ever run into. He could walk through six inches of oak leaf mulch in the woods in the fall and you couldn't hear them wow but the ticks could and and that's why you have to learn how to take ticks <laughs> yeah. off so 
So on, on you know, in that spirit, um, you were tick aware. Um, you were you were given the tools on how to remove ticks, uh, yet you kept getting bitten, and you ultimately became chronically ill. And we're going to get to that. Um, you know, starting when you were a child and, and and continuing to develop during the course of your life. So, um, give me your thoughts on on why awareness is not enough when dealing with ticks and tick diseases because you were aware but you kept getting bitten and you were aware and you did uh repeatedly get sick so tell us why that's not enough awareness is not enough well there there's i'll, I'll back up and do something before that because most people think lyme disease is tick-borne disease and it's absolutely not um it's a fluid transfer disease Ticks okay. happen to be one of the vehicles where where fluid is transferred from one host to another. But when you start to look at the mechanisms of Lyme disease and how people get infected and all that, anything that takes a bodily fluid from an infected host and transfers it to another one can transfer Lyme disease. So... <clears throat> mosquitoes they've they've uh they've looked at mosquitoes they found um borrelia the lyme bacteria inside the eggs they watch it through the nymph stage the adult stage is still live and well and can be transferred all the way through that if you look up in the northwest like minnesota wisconsin Mosquitoes are a huge way to do it. Biting flies, tear flies. We had people come in with ad gnats, spiders down in the south. There, you can share a milkshake. It's in sexual fluids. It's in saliva. It's it's in three up to three percent, two to three percent of the uh, blood bank in Minnesota and Wisconsin. I mean, you, you you've got all these different ways to do that to transfer that. So that's one of the reasons why. That's not enough. But what really sets the stage for people to get Lyme disease isn't the bite. It isn't the introduction of Lyme bacteria in them. It's their state of health when that happens. The immune system should be able to, to take care of it. But there's all kinds of things that weaken the immune system so that we can't fight those things off. That's actually more the key in resolving all these chronic issues. Uh, as a for instance, when in working with hundreds of people with Lyme disease, we've never seen one case that was not the predisposing factor is the same thing as the biggest complication. That's candida. Global infections candida comes in three forms is closely associated with the fourth and that's yeast fungus fungal parasite is absolutely candida and with that you got other yeast forms also but candida is the biggest one it's, it's the most known and mold is closely associated with it okay so that's... let's pause there for a second um because you are, you are certainly speaking our language um we can debate a little bit about uh what is the what is the um the vehicles for, for transmission we here at tech boot camp certainly agree that um that ticks are a vehicle but not the only vehicle for transmitting uh lyme disease uh we we do also believe there is uh growing evidence that sexual transmission is a vehicle for transmitting lyme disease we, we think there's there's certainly um irrefutable evidence to uh, support the position that um Congenital Lyme disease is um, is one of the ways that uh, people are getting Lyme disease, um, and I think there is irrefutable irrefutable evidence that um, that um, that uh, blood banks and um, you know and blood transfusions are a vehicle for for Lyme disease. The other vectors you talked about, I think we can debate a little bit more about um, and and why perhaps ticks because of the unique um, unique uh, um, attachment and periods of attachment that that uh, ticks have and the unique properties of their spit make them better um, vectors uh, and vehicles for transmission than some of the other, um, you know, some of the insects you described before. 
But uh, with that sort of preview, let's talk about um, what is the likelihood of, of getting Lyme disease. And um, and we here at Tick Bootcamp talk about risk all the time. And uh, following uh, uh, General McChrystal's um, argument in his book, Risk, Risk is a Formula, and it's threat times vulnerability. And you were focusing on the vulnerability part of that um, a little bit less than the than the threat piece of it. Uh, and and like you, I agree that the vulnerability piece is important. And, and, so, and let's let's bring this sort of back to your. Well, first, let me ask you: Do you agree that the risk of Lyme disease is in fact formulaic, and that formula is threat times vulnerability? There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, we we have our own means of doing our our testing, and we we test ticks all the time. Um, to see whether they are a quote threat, and sometimes they're clean and you don't have to worry so much. But if they're dirty, um, then it, it's it's one of those things. Okay, so what do we do now? In preemptive things, you can avoid the whole nightmare. Um, like you were talking earlier about yourself, you you went to your doctor and that that can be one of the worst things you can do because it sets the stage for all kinds of, of different things. But the, the dirtier the exposure, the greater the threat. And so, so let, but let's talk about that, uh, Dr. Brad, because we, we do have, um, we do have some issues with the CDC, for example, um, sort of looking, looking negatively upon testing ticks. And the argument that they make is, that um, you know that we can get false negatives from tick testing, so maybe we shouldn't be doing it. Now, I disagree with the CDC on that position. Uh, I think we should be testing our ticks, but one of the things I think we have to be careful about is that the research shows that a tick could harbor up to 200 different microbes, yet we only can test about 19 different microbes, I think, on the high side. So one of the things that, uh, you know, that I'm always concerned about when we're talking about tick testing um, is when we do test the tick and we are determining that the tick is in fact a clean tick, really all what we're saying is of the 19 microbes we can test. In fact, if you are testing all 19, that's all we're, 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 we're saying. We, we, we really can't say that a, that a tick is clean. And quite frankly, I don't believe any tick is ever clean. Well, that, that's a valid point. You, you look at the way that they live. It's a, uh, they, I'll back that up. If you take a electron micrograph picture of a leaf or your skin, you can't see this, the, the coating of the leaf or you can't see the skin. The amount of microbes on the top of that just completely cover the entire thing. We live in a microbial world where we have microbes all over on top of us, inside of us, absolutely everywhere. And that the health of that microbial environment, especially internally, especially in the mucous membranes and the gut, reproductive tracts, nose, uh, ears, things like that, those are some of the biggest determining factors on the health that we have. So <clears throat> clean is probably not a, a good word for that. It's more like, uh, the, the comparison would be more like a benign as compared to extremely pathological. Okay, so I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. So we're, we're now getting, now starting to dig in on the vulnerability piece of the, uh, of the risk formula, right? In your argument, I'm not surprised as a functional uh, doc that um, that uh, although um, the Borrelia um, bacteria um, is um, is is a bacteria that can make you sick. Uh, however, it is ultimately um, you know um, um, put in your body. Um, we have during the course of human evolution have come in contact with that bacteria. Um, as long as there have been people, right? So we do have we do have natural defenses or natural immune defenses to keep us um, 
uh, from getting sick from certainly that bacteria. However, we are getting sick at an alarming increasing rate. One of the things we were talking about before this, um, before we started taping, uh, was that you know that that Lyme disease is uh, is developing exponentially, right? So, mm -hmm. is it your position that the reason it is developing exponentially is not because the microbe is becoming a greater threat? It's because we are becoming less capable of of um, defending ourselves from that microbe or the combination of microbes that are being spit into us or put into us with the various fluid vehicles that could cause us to um, have to deal with that microbe. Yeah, that that's well said. Um, when you look at just the change in our supply chain, our food supply, just in the last few years with the COVID that's gone on. The amount of toxicity that's been introduced in multiple ways. Uh, food is a huge one as far as that goes, herbicides, pesticides, insecticides, things along that line. Now you got appeal. It's another toxic thing that goes on there. There's so many different things that are done to the food supply. Half our immune systems in the gut. Uh, everything that gives us life other than oxygen comes through the gut. And if you do anything to weaken the health of the gut, which is what candida does, you're extremely vulnerable, extremely uh, you, you you take all the broad spectrum antibiotics that are used uh, wholesale in the United States. One dose can destroy the the, the microbial environment in the gut completely. Will will never recover unless you do some specific things. Which, if I didn't have the background I have in dealing with the gut candida and things like that we couldn't do anything with lyme disease okay so let, let me come back to your journey right because one of the things that my co-host matt um, um customarily asks our guests is whether or not before they were diagnosed they started to take steps to improve their health right they they sort of instinctively began to take steps to improve their health and one of the things that i was i wanted to come back to with you and your in your journey is as early as five years old, you realized um, that there were some things you needed to do in order to be able to function at um, at the same level as the rest of your family. And one of that was take control of your diet, right? You were beginning to make changes even before you were diagnosed, even before you were old enough to even understand what was going on. You did understand that um, that you, you needed to take control of your diet. And that was something that stayed with you and ultimately, I'm sure, became uh, a part of the reason why you became a functional uh, functional doc. But we'll, we'll get there in a second, all right? But one of the things we talk about in this podcast all the time is, uh, you know, low and no cost um, uh, steps that you should take and, 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 and sort of getting yourself ready to, to go on this journey. We talk about prehabilitation, right? And, and, and three of the areas that we recommend people uh, begin to think about changing before they, you know, engage in any of these heroic uh, activities is to take control of their diet, take control of their movement, and take control of their sleep. Give me, give me um, an outline of what you were doing in addition to taking control of your diet at this you know, tender age of five to seven years old. Were you doing anything with your sleep and were you doing anything with your movement that was also a vital part of you laying the foundation that, um, that uh, allowed you to overcome these challenges later in life? Uh, I've always been an extremely active kid uh, uh, person. At my age... Um, you know, if I've been doing functional medicine for close to 40 years, I got some years under my belt. I still outwork doing construction things, people close to half my age. Um, and, and that's just me. Always has been. And I I don't expect that to, to really change at all. So that's always been the case. When you're, when you're physically tired, it's pretty easy to rest. But uh, what set the stage for me um, for the Lyme disease, I, you know, outdoors, we we're doing farming at the time, raising horses, training horses, doing all kinds of things. And I wake up in the middle of the, you know, sometimes you just wake up and feel a, 
a, a tick crawl up your leg would wake you up in bed. You know, they, they were so thick, it was ridiculous where I was living. And wake up in the middle of the night with extremely deep, boring pain in my left armpit as a deer tick. Uh, and, and that's one thing about deer ticks. A lot of the other ticks are, are not necessarily giving that much pain, but deer ticks tend to be extremely painful when they bite. And that's one of the warning signs. But uh, that happened twice in, in I don't know how long a period of time. And it was sometime after that where I started getting malaria-like fevers. I mean, 104, 104 and a half and spiking up from there. And when you're an adult... Give, give, a, give us a context before you finish uh, sharing that with us. How, how old were you then? Because you talked about being bitten all Middle the age, right. probably uh, mid, probably 40s. Okay, so we so let, let let let's get there. You know, just let's build off of the folks' chronology of life because we talked about you growing up the Bay Area. You were there until you're about 26. You were in the construction trades. How was your health in that window of time between when you started taking control of your of your diet and your food intake, and when you left the West Coast when you were when you were in your uh, mid to late 20s? It was reasonably good for what I knew at the time. I know a ton more now, and there's much more that I can do, but um, I, I typically don't get sick, but my set point of judging what sick was, was from childhood issues like, like the flu-like vertigo that I had for years. You know, that that was sick. I mean, it was really sick. And anything less than that really wasn't much of a thing to me because I had to struggle with that so much. It made you have to me concentrate so much on where I was in space and movement and how I moved and, and different things. So the, the concentration to just be able to function was pretty intense. And, and so anything less than that's not that big of a thing, but I started getting uh, major chronic problems with candida as a young kid. And that. So how, how did you know that it was candida? Was that something that uh, you've now recognized in retrospect, or were you diagnosed um, during your childhood with having suffered from candida? When you look at the studies on the testing of candida, they're as bad as Lyme disease. They're, they're atrocious. They're just not functional whatsoever. Uh, the way I knew I had candida, my tonsils were usually commonly twice as big as what they should be, deep fissures in them, and it looked like they'd grown blue cheese more than six months out of the year. Constant sore throat, uh, ears, and you know, they call them infections, but most of the time that's um, so yeah, you. you there's a visual of this fungal, deep fungal infection embedded in my tonsils a large part of my life. I mean, you, you just couldn't mistake it. So, of course, the can, candida is immunosuppressive, right? And we, we've been we exactly. were sort of like touching around a lot of these different pieces. We talked about the 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 risk formula of threat times vulnerability. We 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 talked about how you were you were constantly being bitten by ticks. So the risk of you getting sick certainly was, was, um, was pretty high, uh, but you were doing pretty well, right? I mean, you, 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 you mm -hmm. had your, had your ups, you had your downs, you had your take bites, you had, uh, you know, different uh, with challenges with illness, but you were actually functioning, you know, at a, at a, at a pretty high level. You graduated from high school and you uh, worked in the construction trades and you ultimately then felt a calling to go back to school. Now, was that driven by, uh, by a, personal set of physical illnesses that caused you to now want to pursue, um, you know, uh, profession in the, in the, in the healing arts arena, or was it something else? Uh, was the fact that the Lord got a hold of me in, in a pretty dramatic way. And we've had a lot of conversations 
and he's orchestrated a lot of things in my life. And he gave me um, four specific things to do in that season of life. One was to quit work and go to school. I hated school. I despise school. I I think it's the biggest waste of time. I can learn a, a whole bunch more in a much faster way and more efficient than school. So uh, it, it, it was a huge thing for me to go back to school. I, I despised it to a in an extremely high degree oh, but when i went i was behind his time schedule so i went to school my way to get in a graduate program it takes most people four to six years i did i did it in 14 months okay so talk to us about that where where did you go to school and how did you compress that time from from four years to 14 months um i started up in the mountains in california in a small town called sonora um, Columbia College. I took a quarter there. I talked to the, my chemistry teacher and asked if I could take two years of chemistry at the same time. Had a quarter of it. And he read me out, uh, told me that he didn't think I was bright enough to even be able to comprehend of doing anything like that. And after he finishes denigrating me as thoroughly as he possibly can, he says, and yeah, it's in our course curriculum, but I haven't taught that class in, you know, it was close to a decade, something like that. So, you know, all I heard with that is I need to find another school. So transferred down to another school, didn't know why my wife at the time was working in a, in a faraway community, ended up going to that school. That school ended up, uh, it was a junior high, Modesto Junior High or junior college, but the word was coming back from people going, leaving Modesto JC, going to Stanford, UCLA, and saying, hey, take your main courses at Stanford, UCLA. It's way easier than at Modesto. They, they just had that caliber of teachers there. Um, I ended up taking second year chemistry before I took the first. <laughs> and, and most people don't realize when you get into higher education, chemistry, to get into higher education, you got all these weeder classes. They're not educational. They're to weed out the cream of the crop. 75% uh, failure rate in the first year of chemistry of the 25% that makes it through 75% of those people fail in the second year. The, my chemistry teacher, Modesto, was a research chemist and he taught as a research chemist. There's only five or six research chemists teaching in the college system in the United States at that time. Wow. They pooled their tests together. Uh, we got really close and I think from, from the way he interacted and all that, I was the most unique, brightest aptitude student he'd ever had he tried to give me chemistry in in a really really hard way but the way i got through is i just took all the the core curriculum issue to, uh um classes all together and with a with an extremely full schedule like um i think my last semester in that school I only went there two semesters, by the way. So I had a quarter in one school, two semesters down in, in Modesto. And they made me go to guidance class to get some student aid. I'm sitting in the guidance class doing homework. This is like the first or second day of school. And, and then they want you to fill out some papers and some, but it, the, one of the ladies running the class, she comes up to my desk just at the end of the class and picks up my papers and I hear him rattle and, and she looks at him for like 30 seconds. She says, I can't do this. And I don't look up. I said, I can't do what? And she could shake the papers. You can't do this. I says, why can't I do this? You can't do this. Is there school policy against me doing this? I, I can tell she's looking at my schedule because it's insane. It's just insane. And I, you know, I'm thinking this is just a, a stupid, just a stupid 
conversation. And I, I got it from that class. I walked across the uh, campus. I was trying to challenge the first year chemistry. And that the teacher that ran that said they've been talking for close to a decade on what they would do if somebody's going to challenge that class. And he goes, and here you are. And he figured out a way to weasel out of that. So I walk across the campus and I go, hey, I can't come to your lecture. I can I can go. I can take a test uh, before your lecture or after your lecture. It depends on if you think I'm going to ask people on the way out what the questions are. Um, you put me before. If you think I'm going to tell everybody else, you put me afterwards. I can't do that. I can do labs at this period of time. He throws his hands up in there. Whatever. Just do that. So I, I did that. I picked up one other class, which was a Bible as as a literature class uh, filled up my entire schedule, gave me enough credits to to get an AA, get out of that school, and I dropped the guidance class, left there, and um, ended up in uh, in graduate program. All right, so uh, so let's build out the rest of your education. I know there were four things that you were instructed to do. One was quit work and go to school. So finish telling us. Uh, where you went to school, uh, give, sort of build out your resume, all the different educational institutions you attended and what uh, certifications or degrees did you acquire? Okay, all that I went, uh, grade school, junior high, high school. I spent one quarter in Cal Berkeley doing self-paced math class um, and the teacher there, I, I did a year of math a week <laughs> in this self-paced thing, you know, and it's just, I thought maybe I might someday get back to school, but you know, it was, it was math was kind of a, a fun thing for me anyway. So anyway, that was it. I uh, went through, went through that. And once I got the one quarter in Sonora, uh, two semesters in Modesto, and then I, left there, went in the Midwest and got in a graduate program, doctorate. Okay. So um, what was your, what was your concentration when you were in the doctorate program? Chiropractic. And I started studying functional medicine at the same time. Okay. So you said the first thing that the, that you were told to do was leave your job and go uh, go back to school. What were the second, third, and fourth things you were charged with doing in your new life plan? Uh, move out of the area that I was living in. Um, quit work, which I've been working since I was 11 years old. And it's when you take somebody that's productive and fruitful, um, it, that's a hard thing to stop. You know, it just is. It's a, it's a really hard thing to stop. So quit work, go to school, move out of the area I grew up in and, and get married. <clears throat> All right. So talk to us now about um, your um, your professional career. So you so you, you so you left the West Coast. Did you move when when you when you had your charge to move out of there? Did you move to um so move to the mountains. Did you move somewhere else. Move to the mountains first. Mountains move of California. Bay, yeah, move from the Bay Area up into the mountains, um, and went to the mountains back down into the valley, Central Valley, and that that's an interesting place. It it's extremely hot in the Central Valley, and from Central Valley out to the Midwest to go to school. So when did you first start your um, your medical practice? How old were you and where did you start practicing um, chiropractic and functional medicine? Uh, I started in the Minneapolis area and I was 29 or 30. Okay. Right in there. Uh, yeah. But actually, I, uh, Lord, with his time schedule, I didn't realize this till after I got there. I, I, I was started teaching in the in the college I was at when I was there for maybe a year, and that put me in a place where I was pretty much at a full time practice, 
from the teaching that I had. Um, by the time I was there about a year. And it exposed me to some of the best doctors or the most innovative approaches to a multitude of things um, that almost nobody got exposed to. So now, I, you know, just a little foreshadowing, you ended up getting um, getting sick in your late 40s. So let's build out that window of your career between your late 20s when you're beginning um, to practice in the healing arts arena and your late 40s. Uh, what type of work were you doing? And were you working with, generally, and were you working with anyone who had Lyme disease in that window of your career? Um, I had been asked about Lyme disease several times. Um, I was doing chiropractic and functional medicine that entire time. And I'd been asked about working with people with Lyme disease. And like you know, um, it's this elusive study where you try and gain all kinds of information. There's so much misinformation out there and so little information that you can really sink your teeth into. Or if you look at a biblical uh, allegory, it's, it's a peg on the wall that you can grab onto that you know is secure and you you know you have something you can work with. Lyme disease is not like that because it's such this fluid, elusive thing that not many really understand the mechanisms and all that, uh, which is something that's different with me. I, I've always been a physiology person and I, I, something I still study on a regular basis. So I, I needed mechanisms. I needed something where you could go, okay, this is what's going on. But no one, you, you look through the different annals and you have this narrative of what is wanted to be promoted, but it's not necessarily very accurate. Uh, nor is it very valuable as far as clinical outcomes go. Okay, uh, but, but Dr. Brett, let me let me just bring you back to the the question that I was that I was asking, which is in that window of time between when you started practicing um, chiropractic and and functional medicine in your late twenties, early thirties, and the time that you became sick in your late forties, were you aware of Lyme disease, and were you treating anyone for Lyme disease in that window of your career? Okay, I was aware of it. People had asked me about working with them with Lyme disease. I, I probably worked with some people that had it that didn't know because, as you're you're aware, the diagnostic means that most people use is is just not all that accurate. Yeah, they, but, I mean, di diagnostic testing. Let's just be blunt. Sucks. So yep. you know you don't you don't really have uh, certainly objective diagnostic tests. I mean, obviously there are there are clinical tools that good clinicians can use. So so again, in that window of time, um, you you were likely treating people with Lyme disease. You certainly didn't have great diagnostic tools. But I'm asking you where your skill set was before you had gotten sick. Um, you know, had you had you been taking courses on Lyme disease? Did you did you during the course of any of your educational um, or post educational uh, training, know anything about Lyme disease and were you treating anyone uh, with the disease prior to you getting sick in your late 40s? I knew it existed. I knew it was a, a problem. I knew what caused it. But as far as having tools to really work with it clinically effectively, those didn't come until after I got sick. Which is, which is customarily what we're seeing, right? I mean, the real experts in this community are the people who have been on the journey themselves, right? Um, right. And there are a lot of different reasons for that. But, you know, because, because there are so many presentations uh, and so many different permutations, uh, on some level, I just don't think you can really know it unless you know it, right? And, that, and that's one of the, the unfortunate experiences that you had to have. So talk to us about what was happening to you in your late 40s, right? So you, you, you know, you had, you had 
certainly challenges in your, you know, in your, in your health, uh, starting when you were as young as five years old. But it seems to me that you were able to, uh, both from your experiences and taking control of your diet and your, and your movement and exercise and your sleep. Um, and of course, through just, you know, um, your, your, your medical training, you were able to keep yourself pretty healthy despite all the tick bites in your life until, until your late forties. Talk to us about what changed in your late forties. Extreme stress. And for, for people who are not aware, the hormones that um, you, we create under extreme stress destroy the gut, destroy the microbiota in the gut, which is where half the immune system is. It taxes the immune system to a tremendous degree, and it makes people vulnerable to, to things like this. So it was the diet that set that stage. It was extreme stress that set the stage to beat me up where I couldn't fight it off. Okay, so let's let's build that a little bit because we 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 did when we were talking about the the risk formula, threat times vulnerability. We we did talk, uh, you or I should say you you did talk a great deal about how um, our um, our food uh, stream has changed and how the nutritional values have essentially crashed. And you believe that that's one of the important reasons why we're more vulnerable to uh, illness generally and Lyme disease in particular. Uh, but now let's talk about stress, right? Because we are living in a high stress environment uh, and we do know that stress is immunosuppressive. So talk to us about stress generally and how that makes us more vulnerable to illness and then build out for us how you were living in a stressful environment in your late 40s and how that uh, that element of vulnerability caused you to become chronically ill. Okay. There's... There are several different mechanisms why stress does that, but I'm going to concentrate on the gut because okay. that's what makes the stage the biggest. When, Whenever there's any kind of, uh, you know, I wrote about this in a book that I published and I sent you. Um, you have all these mechanisms whereby people get, overgrowth of candida it, it never goes away it should always be in balance but you got all these different mechanisms you have antibiotics you have NSAIDs you have poor diet you have heavy metals you got chronic stress and looking at the physiological interactions that go on about it uh, I've, I've come to the conclusion that anything that creates inflammatory reaction within the gut makes the lining of the gut called microvilli. And microvilli is like if you hold your hand up in front of your face and you look at your fingers, um, there are little things that protrude out into the inside of the gut that increases the lining uh, surface of the gut about 400 times. It's crazy how much it is. And it's in between those those projections, those microvilli, uh, they produce mucus. It's in between those where all the flora lives, and it caps over the top of that. Anything that creates a chronic inflammatory response make those things atrophy. So it's like if you take your fingers and you close a fist and you roll it so you just see your knuckles. That's more what the lining looks like. No place for the flora to live. Um, it gets washed out in the toilet. It sets you, there's a there's an autoimmune reaction going on because it got leaks like a sieve um, to destroy the gut even further. It leaks like a sieve. It overloads the liver with all kinds of toxins and fragments of the microbes that are in there that create the super autoimmune responses. Uh, in other words, it, it sets the stage for people to be so immunosuppressed that they can't really fight off these. Uh, it's almost like Lyme is like a designer uh, type of a microbe. And, and Lyme never comes by itself. It always has a host of other 
microbes with it that are as bad, oftentimes worse than the Lyme disease is itself. And there's just not the fight left because of the the stage being set to to really deal with these things. So you're in your late forties. Uh, can you can you give us at a high level? I, I I don't want to be too intrusive. What type of stresses were you dealing with, which were not relational? High- I'm sorry. Relational stresses. Okay. And so you so you're having some you're having some relationship issues at that time in your life. Uh, they become overwhelming, and you and you outline for us how that was physiologically impacting you. So. Uh, you now you're now suffering from immunosuppression, uh, and uh, you have all kinds of things going on that are causing inflammation, that are causing you to suffer from leaky gut. Which, of course, we know with a leaky gut, um, that becomes um, you know that that is in, in many cases why we have so many food al- food allergies because the, your immune system is then responding to um, you know to foods in many cases as as microbes, and we're, we're finding ourselves having allergies. I mean, it just it becomes this really really difficult cycle. So how did that present for you? I mean, how sick did you get? Um, from the Lyme disease or from the stress? Yes. I mean, how sick were you generally? I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're in your 40s. Okay. You, you, you're uh, not diagnosed. Uh, I mean, we can, we can, we right. can um, preview I, folks that you didn't get diagnosed until your 50s, right? So there's this window of time where you, you, you're very, very sick in your late 40s and you're not diagnosed until your 50s. So what, how sick did you get? Give us the progression of your illness. Um, really, it didn't notice anything until I started getting these crazy high fevers. Okay, and and that was my first indication that something was was wrong. You know, one hundred four, one hundred four and a half, spiking up from there. That's, I mean, you you can have some neurological damage. Yeah, as an adult with things like that, stars yeah, but- shoot through the vision and. You know, all, all kinds of different things. That was the biggest thing. Um, that was the biggest concern for me because I'd lived so much under the weather of extreme levels of sickness that my set point for what is really sick is laid out flat and you can't get up. Anything else was you just learn how to talk, how to manage it and work with it. But the fever, that's a, one of those obvious things that's in your face that that's, could be lethal. It's it's extremely dangerous, and you just go, wow, I, you just got to deal with this. Okay, so you, you had these high fevers. You did share with us. You, you began to have neurological symptoms, which you were the, describing as these stars streaking. What other symptoms did you, did you develop in this window between – your late forties and uh, up until the time you were diagnosed in your in your fifties in your early fifties. Um, the typical thing that people get with Lyme disease, flu-like symptoms, malaise. Uh, your energy starts decreasing quite a bit, and you know. But as I said, I, I lived in that state so much when I was young, that wasn't really something that I, I, I would put any attention on for myself. So you, you're talking about the, the lack of energy uh, was something that you had managed for a good portion of your life. So you weren't <clears throat> making a big deal about it, but you were suffering from, um, you know, from a lack of energy. Yeah, lack of energy, just the other like stuff, just not feeling good. So um, share with us how you were, you know, how you were finally diagnosed. I it was myself who I finally ran in across some tools uh, in the Lyme arena that I it's like, okay, now I have something I can work with. Uh, there were some diagnostic tools, and once I have some diagnostic tools, i've I've got all these ways where we can challenge any diagnostic thing with therapies to find out how to resolve it and and once i finally started getting those tools which uh that toolkit's in in a constant state of change and flux and and all that but it it opened up a, a huge arena which 
way you know myself and, and others it just started to blossom into a, a practice that that ended up being primarily Lyme disease okay. instead of something else. But Dr. Brad, there, there again, there's this window window between your late forties and your early fifties where you're really, really sick. I mean, you had been managing illness during the entirety of your life, but you're functioning at a very high level. Um, you had been managing, you know, a lack of energy during all of, you know, during all of your early life, but, you know, not to the point where it became, uh, it became overwhelming, but now you have this window of time between your late forties and your early fifties, uh, where you finally get diagnosed, um, self-diagnosed with Lyme disease. What changed? Why did you finally settle on Lyme after having all of these symptoms for many years? Um, it was actually... You know, the biggest infection in me was Babesia. Okay. Um, which is cause of the malaria like fevers. Right. Lyme, Lyme was there. Um, and, it, you know, it commonly is, but Babesia is a much more voracious beast than Lyme disease is. And there's a bunch of different reasons why. So once the fevers drop down, and they only stayed around for a while. Uh, that drove me to uh, a friend of mine threatened that if I didn't go to medical doctor to find out what's going on, he was going to drag me into one. So, you know, I hadn't seen a medical doctor in over 30 years. I hadn't had a aspirin maybe 40 years. Um, and it was just not something that I did. Um, so, so it was an interesting, interesting thing. And I went into a clinic and guy did an evaluation, never touched me, never listened to my chest, ordered some lab tests, said, you got influenza here, uh, take ibuprofen. And I knew people are taking three, 800 milligram ibuprofen three, four times a day at that period of time. I got the smallest bottle of ibuprofen I could find 250 milligram. First dose, I got hallucinations. I said, I am not doing this again. I'm just, I'm not doing this again. I'll, I'll deal with the, with the fevers. And you know, the fevers, I don't remember how long the fevers lasted. So, so, you know, somewhere between weeks. I don't know if they lasted that high two months. And I, I don't remember that specifically okay but so they, they subsided so so let's so so you were you were you were able to determine that you had lyme and babesia at least were there any other um tick diseases that you believe that you were um that you were managing at that time uh or like yeah, or cats, yeah. Um, candida was another part of that picture that I had conquered that, but the stress had allowed that to grow. So, so you had you had a whole cocktail of 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 aggressive microbes uh, in your body. So you, you're finally diagnosed um, in your early fifties, and um, and how did you begin to treat these various microbes? What kinds of changes were you making in your diet, in your exercise, in your in your in your sleep patterns? Uh, what kinds of supplements were you using? What kinds of pharmaceuticals, of any, were you using? Tell us about how you're now treating um, all of these aggressive microbes. Okay. Um, being a, a physiological person that I am, I take a different approach than a lot of people do. We lay the foundation of um, nutrient needs first before we start to add antimicrobials. So mm -hmm. that's always going to be a really, really good multivitamin, mm -hmm. a really good fish oil, really good source of calcium. You got to do some different things to heal the gut wall. And like what? What, what? what kinds of things would you do to heal the gut wall? Well, as, as one, for instance, I don't think 
myself, I didn't have this, but I, I think I might be the only one we've seen with Lyme disease that didn't have a huge problem with H. pylori. Um, so you have to address that. Uh, that's different. Um, and uh, antimicrobials, you do with that, and you've got to use special form of zinc. Zinc carnosine is is critical. Okay, so uh, let's, let's pause that for a second. So you're talking about what you were doing to prepare yourself for the antimicrobials. You don't just jump into antimicrobials. And you gave us a list of different things that you were you were you were taking as uh, from a supplement standpoint. Um, when did you know you were ready for uh, the antimicrobials, and what antimicrobials did you choose? Um, I always put everything together. So I, I don't compartmentalize. We don't do things in stages. We we do everything together. But, so what, what, what does that mean? I, I'm, I'm confused. You said we I did everything together, but I did everything in stages. So what's the difference between stages? Uh, no, I said, we, I said we don't do things in stages. Oh, like you do not do not so we find out what people need for their foundation we test them for what supplements they need to take care of that we test to see what they need to rebuild the gut to deal with things like h pylori and we had to start playing with antimicrobials and i've got uh quite a a, a few different antimicrobials that we use um depending on what's going on, depending on what age somebody is, depending on whether somebody's pregnant or not there, you know, there's, there's quite a bit, but some of the ones that are key would be berberine. Um, that's pretty key. Ginger is, is pretty important. Uh, oregano oil is pretty important. Thyme oil is pretty important. Uh, a lot of the herbs that classically used in the Lyme arena. We've tested a multitude of those and and they, they're not as effective as what people would really, really think. Okay. So, so you, you you were talking about your journey and the uh the antimicrobials you had used. So what did what did you specifically use um on the antimicrobial front um after your diagnosis with Lyme disease? Um I tried a whole bunch of different products uh, doing di different things. And the ones that, uh, the the herbs that actually work really well, um, berberine would be a huge part. The, the two um, aromatic oils that I talked about, black walnut, tends to work pretty well as far as that goes. But and did that, so, did, did those herbs, I'm asking you specifically in your case, when you were sick, did you use those herbs and were they helpful for you? Yeah. Okay. What other herbs did you use? Uh, what other antimicrobial herbs did you use that, were, that you found to be effective for you? And again, we understand that everyone is a bio individual and everyone is going to have a different combination of germs that they're dealing with. You had, you had a whole chock full of these uh, of these germs, but um, with that general understanding of bioindividuality, and um, and of course, an element of that is having a diverse, um, you know, uh, microbial um, uh, and 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 biome. Um, what uh, what else did you use that was effective uh, in helping you to improve your health? Those were the primary ones. Okay. Uh, we 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 rotated some other things, and as you heal, those change very very commonly. So okay, so talk to us about what you pivoted to after um, as you were beginning to heal. Um, I, I I don't remember specifically in my own case what that is. Okay, you know we've there's been an evolution in what I've done where. Now we can nail it pretty quickly and start making some changes extremely quickly. Okay, so let's talk about let's talk about now um, how you begin to start treating patients with Lyme disease. Right? One of the things we've heard from so many of the doctors that we've interviewed is that 
uh, they realized that many of the people that they had been treating before their own diagnosis, so before they became what I call Lyme woke, um, probably had Lyme disease, but they didn't really have the diagnostic and treatment tools available to them. So they weren't able to do that. But now they start to see so many people that have Lyme disease, right? So you've been on your journey. You now understand Lyme. You understand what it's like to go through Lyme. You now understand how to treat Lyme because of your journey. How many now cases do you have of people in your practice uh, that have Lyme disease? And how are you now able to not only be better at diagnosing them, but better at treating them on their uh, healing journey? Okay. The diagnosis is very unique as far as that goes. Uh, going back to physiology, we evaluate every organ system at a level of minutia in every function there is. Uh, and typically a diagnostic way that we approach people is we go through all of the metabolic and hormonal functions first at a level of minutia. You, you couldn't get the information that we get in one of our evaluations of a lab test, but it, you drop a lot of money trying to get there. So we always start with a complete metabolic evaluation, find out what root issues are, how to resolve those. Once that's done, we set that aside. We go through a huge battery of food intolerance testing to find out what foods these people can eat that will bring healing and remove anything that's not going to do that. And how are you determining that, uh, Dr. Brad? How, how are you determining what foods are going to be helpful in a particular case and what foods are going to be harmful in a particular case uh, on a healing journey? We, we use a pretty creative way to do that. When you look at the food intolerance uh, lab testing, it's only two to 3% accurate. Okay. And the, re the reason why is it's the same kind of testing they use for uh, the Lyme, Lyme disease. They use illicit type of testing, even though it's state of the art, it really doesn't have any accuracy. The PRCA is, is, is just unusable as far as that goes. But <clears throat> there's so many diverse types of responses that foods can have. Some of them are neurological, some are in brain, some affect circulation, all, all kinds of different things. It's just not a way to chase that. So we primarily use muscle testing to do that with diagnostic vials as far as that goes. And when we moved from where we well, when we were preparing to move, we'd been asked by a bunch of people to figure out how to do that on a distance so we could keep working with them. And I really didn't have the belief system to do that at that time, but it was pretty obvious the Lord was moving us to a, a different area. And it's like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll test this out. So we started testing people at farther and farther distances. And at the end of my testing, we were, we, we're testing people. We didn't know who they were, what they had. We do a full diagnostic uh, series at a distance. Then we bring them in the office and repeat it. And the first time we did that, uh, it was a very humbling experience for me. The Guess what the difference in the results were? What? No difference. They were 100% really? identical, which is statistically impossible. And we just realized the Lord granted us an accuracy and an authority that's not natural because of the integrity with which we did stuff with. And as I said, it was a pretty humbling experience. And, and you know, so we started doing that. Um, so, so essentially, we go through uh, an extensive amount of food um, testing as far as that goes. And most of that's commercial, but we have a fair amount of organic mixed in with our kid and all that. And once we start working with people, people that are really sick in chronic stage, you have to test them on their own food supply that they can get in their own markets, whether it's farmers market, grocery stores, or wherever they shop. And we've got to find out what brands are going to work in that locale of that region of the world and, and all that. So it's the only way to be able to do that is is one muscle test and there's not another way to do that 
So okay. we that's the second stage of our testing. Third stage, we go through infectives and uh, toxins. So we've got a whole slew of different Borrelia bacteria. You know, most of, firstly, all of the uh, tests, lab tests for Lyme disease is the Borrelia burgdorferi, the B31 strain. That's the least likely strain to give somebody an infection. That's one of the reasons why the, that test is so inaccurate. There's m other strains that are highly likely to, but, you know, we go through a whole host of uh, bacteria, uh, parasites, <clears throat> most of the, you know, significant amount of the co-infections, Bartonella, Babesia, several strains of Babesia, Rickettsia, we got different strains of Rickettsia, Arlichia, different strains of that, whole host of, of parasites along with that, viruses, uh, other fluid uh, transfer diseases, uh, as far as that goes. And then we go through um, internal toxins and environmental toxins, find out what that is. And, and with the infective issue, mold is always a part of that. So Dr. Redwin, and, and I, I want you to pause for a second on the mold and let me walk back. So all the, the this second and third level, I'm sorry, this third and fourth level of testing that you're doing, the microbial testing, um, and the toxin tech, uh, testing, is that all, um, all muscle testing as well? Correct. Yeah, we, we, we do our own labs and then we, we do diagnostic questionnaires, 95% is accurate with lab tests. We, we start off with that to do consoles, gives a really good idea on what's going on. We do our own in-house lab tests and the rest of that is- so When you say lab test, you're, you're meaning, you mean, the muscle testing. This is not blood testing. This is muscle testing. No, lab lab testing. Uh, we use urine, not blood. We okay. use urine, and we do a bunch of markers with urine that are really, really critical markers, as far okay. as that goes. Okay, great. Um, let's talk about mold. Um, you know, that's a topic that we deal with on a pretty regular basis on this podcast. Um, you know, the the first time we started to to focus on mold was that we had heard from Dr. Rawls and Dr. Phillips, and I think maybe even Dr. Horowitz, that in most cases, when somebody's bitten by a tick, uh, they're unlikely to get sick immediately unless there are one of two factors that would surface. One being that they've been by multiple ticks at the same time. And the second is if somebody's living in a moldy environment uh, and they and they suffer a tick bite, in many cases, that would cause them to have a, an accelerated path to chronic illness. Uh, and then as time went on, we started hearing more and more about mold and the impact that mold is having. And um, we, in, we, we've interviewed several doctors that told us that they actually treat mold first, because in many cases, if you can resolve the mold toxicity, uh, your immune system will be able to manage the microbes um, on its own. So talk to us about mold and what role that plays in your diagnostic testing. And um, do, you, uh, do you recommend that folks focus on uh, mold issues before they uh, before they start to use uh, heroic methods, whether they be herbal or pharmaceutical methods of, um, of, of trying to kill the bugs? Okay, good question. As I said, we address everything together at the same time. So when you look at mold, the unique thing about candida in the yeast form, the fungal form, fungal parasite form, and mold, uh, closely associated. Most of the yeast will convert into molds, not all of them. So the unique thing about all of those is their, uh, their outer, their, their cell walls are made up of what's called chitin. Chitin is the same material that is the outside skeletons of beetles. Uh, it's also what's on shrimp. The chitin is impervious to your immune system. So your immune system can't touch it. And that, that's one of the biggest reasons why mold is such a big issue, because we don't have a mechanism to deal with it. 
Then when you take on top of that, if you've ever seen an electron micrograph of pollen, or if you look at those ninja tools like stars or uh, the uh, medieval weapon call, I think it was called a mace, that spiked ball on the end of a chain. That's what your mold spores look like. Um, that's what pollen looks like. So mold typically comes in through the lungs. Uh, and it you, you have this skeleton of chitin with all these spikes and all that, along with all these toxins, coming into extremely sensitive, highly vascular tissue called the lungs. Uh, it can be expelled back out through the lungs commonly. It'll get into the uh, you have some get into the bloodstream from the lungs and tries to filter out the liver. The liver is going to be overwhelmed from toxicity from a multitude of different ways. And the liver is only one of four detox organs, by the way. The gut wall, the colon wall, and the flora are the other three. So, and we're supposed to be able to keep these toxins in this tight loop of the liver back to the gut, back to the liver, back to the gut. And when the liver gets overwhelmed, it goes systemic. And that's where you really start to have problems. So <clears throat> when you look at mold, the issue isn't so... Mold rarely grows inside of us. It's primarily a constant exposure of these chitin-spiked balls of toxicity that are coming in. So when we're working with people distance, the mold, um, mold evaluations of their living spaces is part of what we do. We can find those to a tremendous degree. The amount of people that we've had going through their house and we stop them where they hit something toxic, ask where they are, uh, you know, if there's like a window or in the laundry, something, I have them start to move their hand around. We find it and go, it's right there. And they look at their, their finger and they go, I, I can't believe it. I just cleaned this. And right at the end of my finger, I see mold growing. Um, one of the best ways to deal with mold is, is acid. All the other um, treatments don't work very well at all. When you're looking at finished surfaces, Vinegar is a really good way to do that. Uh, it often take, takes at least three coats, sometimes five coats. Uh, depends on how penetrated deep into something something is. If, if it's an unfinished surface like bare wood, concrete, something like that, muriatic acid, the low VOC muriatic acid, that stuff, it, it destroys chitin. It melts it. And, and that's the critical issue, is, is it doesn't take that much to clear a place of mold. Um, people are just using the wrong kind of products, and they're not finding where it is and not, not addressing it in a proper way. So you can, you can kill it. You can vacuum it up with a HEPA um, vacuum. You can throw away the bag, throw away the filter, put a new one in, coat it again, do that several times, and you can clean a place up pretty pretty well with mold that's the biggest issue with mold is you have to kill the source you you don't kill what's inside of you because it's going to filter out you kill the source and the antimicrobials it, it doesn't take much of a tweak with the antimicrobials it's typically the same antimicrobials you're going to be using for let's say a fungal infection um, so what, what what are the best antimicrobials for uh for, in your view, for mold? Uh, you're going to need aromatic oils, um, like like we talked about. Um, um, most people, it's going to be a combination of probably berberine, garlic, black walnut. I mean, those would be pretty high on the list. Okay. As, as far as what that, what works for that. Okay. So 
Give us the rest of your treatment protocol. Um, and again, I, I understand you do not do it in stages. I want to be clear about that. You do it all at once. Uh, what other testing and other treatments do you use when somebody is coming to you with um, a, a Lyme uh, diagnosis or Lyme symptoms? Uh, okay. Our approach is, is, is significantly different than a lot of people experience. First... Uh, First uh, evaluation, we 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 evaluate all of everything. Right. So you have uh, it, it's it's not over the course of time. We give people products if it's distance. You know, we got to wait till the mail can get that to them, and we check them a week later. After that, and we do small amount of testing. On uh, I'll, I'll, I'll back up. We redo extensive levels of, of, of the testing at a monthly basis. And we do uh, it, testing on all kinds of other things on a weekly basis till we get people stable. So the, that average is pretty close to about six weeks. And in that six weeks, uh, you, know, you, you look at how long it takes to clear things H. pylori, you can usually have that gone in close to six weeks. Um, if somebody has clostridia, that one rules because you got to deal with clostridia. Uh, if you don't deal with clostridia the right way, your antimicrobials can give them explosive diarrhea, put them in the hospital with dehydration oh. in 24 hours. So clostridia rules, you got to deal with clostridia. You can usually have that cleared out in, say, seven to 10 days something like like that then you can start to jump in with your antimicrobials after that um you look or her, herlichia usually you can clear that in close to six weeks rickettsia is about six to eight most of the borrelia you can usually clear out in about six to eight weeks depends on what form of borrelia or not borrelia but the bc you have divergence is the worst that Average is about four months. The lighter ones, like my karate, two, two and a half, is pretty common. Um, you get people so they're eating properly. That takes quite a while. You, some people, it takes a while. Some people, it doesn't. We wait till their bowel habits get up to at least twice a day before we start to go any deeper. If we've got to do some liver work, clear out the gallbladder, deal with. Uh, whether you're talking stones, gravel, flukes, uh, fungal parasites, it's really commonplace for all of those to aggregate. You got to flush all those things out, but you can't really start flushing that kind of toxicity out till the the elimination is up. So most people don't realize bowel habits normal is three to five times a day, and that's measured by the societies that don't have any incidence of gastrointestinal disease. It's okay. not it's not a normal in America, but anybody who's really sick, they need to get up there. The sicker you are, the more toxic you are, the more uh, you have to upregulate the bowel habits. Um, you, you can't go anywhere with detox issues and getting into some of the deeper therapies like that with somebody with less than two bowel movements a day. Just cannot do it. You'll make them sick. Whatever toxins you you liberate have to go in the toilet. It's the flora in the colon that determine whether you're going to recycle your toxins or excrete them into the toilet. So okay. those those have to be upregulated quite a bit. Um, you, and you start every time something comes off, uh, you start to resolve something, it commonly changes what you have to approach and what you're doing. So the therapy is not something that's consistent all the way through. It's constantly evolving and changing as people start to clear stuff. Okay. So talk to us about what you think are some of the best detox tools that are available to folks. Uh, fiber. Fiber and water is, is absolutely it. When, when we look at um, bowel function is a huge measuring rod. And it's, it's something 
people are really, they're not used to talking about, but it has to be part of the conversation. You have to keep track of bowel habits. You cannot help somebody guessing what those are. Uh, if, if those slow down, it's, it's huge. And there's a tool you can use to see what your transit time is in your gut from mouth to toilet, your food. One of the easiest ways to do that is take a meal, have some beets, mark down what time that was, and you'll find a red, reddish, burgundy type of a line in your stool when it hits the toilet. Mark that and time that. Normal transit time should be 14 to 18 hours. Okay. A lot of people that are really sick, it's way slower than that. Um, when we look at bowel habits, I had heard one person at one point talk about a girlfriend they had that went once every two to three weeks. And I, I thought they were kidding. That person came into our office when they hit three times a day, they got giddy, their life completely changed. The record we had was once every five to six weeks. Most people would realize that's not normal, but some people think, oh, I, you know, I just don't have to use the toilet so much. So that's wonderful. You're toxic. You're just, you're a toxic cocktail with bowel habits like that. You have to upregulate bowel habits. If the transit time is not what it should be, uh, like hard round balls, that's from not enough fiber and not enough water dehydrated. So those things have to happen. The biggest tool is fiber and water. Most people, when we evaluate them, they're, they're eating probably an average of about 40% of the fiber they need to. So two and a half times whatever they're eating. Uh, you look at bladder habits, those have to be upregulated also men should, should urinate at least five times a day women at least eight okay um so so those are really critical measuring rods you just keep adding fluid as far as that goes most people's water supply is really really toxic if people are living in a city the zero water pitcher has beat every single independent study of every device that's out there for a drip type of filter hands down forever whole house it's aquasana they beat everybody's system hands down every single time so getting a clean water supply distilled water is really the best you can get zero or aquasana would be second best and it really depends on on what that is so getting clean healthy vibrant water is is really really huge if the fiber and the water don't increase the um the bowel habits and get you up to twice a day you're usually talking a thyroid type of a problem or another hormone thyroid would probably be the biggest and the thyroid and adrenal take the biggest hit from all of the toxic spillover from the gut. So you're back to dealing with candida and all that. Thyroid is never a primary issue. It's always reacting to some kind of toxicity. Hashimoto's is easy to resolve. It's And you look at the Lyme community, the amount of people with chronic Lyme and have Hashimoto's, is, it's it's almost a given that you're going to have that, especially if you're female. Um, so it's really not a hard thing to deal with. But if the thyroid's sluggish, then the gut will be sluggish also. And all of the um, adaptogens for thyroid, we, we could quit using those a long time ago because it you can sell people a lot of product, but they're just not effective. They don't do anything. You want to resolve a thyroid, you got to heal the gut. And the thyroid heals itself. The adrenal would be uh, the second one that toxins take out. And it's, it's always the, the thyroid gives your, your basic metabolic energy and your adrenal gives you your stressed energy with that. And which one goes first doesn't matter because the, the other one's going to go very soon. Adrenals harder 
to bring back because it's such a complex organ with so many different functions. It really pushes hard. The adrenal can be a primary issue only if there's a chronic, insane amount of stress, like combat war zone type of something. Right. Uh, and, so your 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 HPA axis would be off. You are you are in fight or flight, and it becomes very difficult for you to heal because your immune system is not working. It's the HPA G T axis, and most don't add the extra, but the hormones are the second uh, control of all of our bodily functions. When you when you tilt one and you dysregulate one, the others try to make up for it and they fall apart. So the adrenals, they make the precursors to all the sexual hormones, uh, pregnenol and DHEA. And those can get converted in both men and women into first progesterone, progesterone converts to testosterone, testosterone converts into estrogen in both men and women in, in that sequence. If there's a chronic stress, there's something called the pregnenolone steel. All of the pregnenolone DHEA gets shunted over to make cortisol and adrenaline, and there's nothing left to make the sexual hormones. So that that goes south with the HPA also. You look at your blood sugar issues. Uh, years ago, I took some training. I, I had been saying for a long time that adrenals were the primary issue driving um, diabetes. Years ago, I took some training for doing DOT physicals. We had to go through a bunch of medications, and sure enough, the primary, most commonly used uh, medication for diabetes is metformin. Metformin stops the, the, the cortisol. It liberates, it dissolves the muscles, liberates amino acids. Amino acids go into the liver. They get converted into sugar and jack the blood sugar up so you can defend your life. Metformin stops the conversion of the amino acids into sugar in the liver. Um, so you have blood sugar dysregulation with with that, and the thyroid's always tied in with it. Also, that's your whole hormonal axis right there. You don't have, you know, you got cholecystokinin that drives the the gut function. That's driven off of stomach acid when it hits the upper intestine, and H. pylori dysregulates that. But uh, you, you look at the whole hormonal axis that we have; it's all tied in with the HPA. You have to add the G, the gonads, and you have to add the T, the thyroid, because it's it's part of that, and people need to understand that because they're not separate. They're all tied together. Okay. So, Dr. Brent, this has been a fascinating conversation, uh, but we, we are going to have to start winding down. You know, we've been together almost two hours. Uh, so let's, let's uh, in order to be fair to you and your family, I am going to, I'm going to ask you to first tell us um, how are you doing today? I mean, you, you were very, very sick um, and you look fantastic for a guy who's 65 years old. You look fantastic. So talk to us about how you went from being chronically ill in your late 40s, early 50s to becoming a really vibrant and healthy looking uh, person at your age. Um, so it's part of what we do. And, and the thing that really determines whether people are going to have a vibrant health is their ability to, to manage their lifestyle. Um, that's another part of what we do. I mean, we, we, we deal with all aspects of, of everybody. And what you just mentioned is, is something that I, I hadn't seen my, my oldest daughter's oldest daughter for quite a few years. And I, I went up to visit them and her first comment, she's like eight years old. Her first comment is mommy, his hair is white. Oh, he guess he's a grandpa. I guess that's okay. The next thing she says is mommy, look at his skin. It looks so healthy. Um, that's a, it's a reflection of managing lifestyle. We, that's something we really work with people a lot to learn how to manage their lifestyle so they can have vibrant health. You, you cannot get there without managing your lifestyle. 
diet's a huge part of that. Sleep's a huge part of that. The most healing thing you can do for your brain is sleep. Um, you know, you 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 watch your relational health. You manage that. Um, you know, that's one of the things that people don't talk about in toxicity is toxic relationships. And it, it's a critical issue to understand if relationships are toxic. And if you're the toxic entity then you got to deal with yourself but most people won't that are that way and if you're not and there's no way to resolve it you really need to evaluate whether that relationship is worth keeping or not and then you know you you look at all of these different things that go on that is the the missing key that actually brings people to the point where they get their life back and, and and it's they don't look at what they can't do because oh. so you, because so they you, can do whatever they want. You're arguing that social detoxification is also an an important part of uh, of healing. It's vital, absolutely vital. So now that we're uh, winding down, I'm going to ask you the final question. Um, and the final question I'm going to ask you today is um, what are three low co cost or no cost tools you'd recommend to someone who is on a healing journey from Lyme disease? Real simple. Throw corn out of your diet. Corn is grown. Uh, all commercial corn is grown using atrazine as a pre-emergent herbicide and and Roundup. Atrazine is 10 times worse than Roundup. It makes everything toxic. Everything that feeds off of corn, get it out of your diet. So that, that, that removes dairy. Uh, there's about a thousand different names for corn. Uh, you, you can look those up, get that out of your diet. 95% of the hard wheat crop is sprayed with Roundup two days to three weeks before harvest. Uh, there's no way it can detoxify. Get that out of your diet. We test people on the cleanest organic wheat that is known. Um, icorn isn't as clean. Prairie gold is actually cleaner than icorn. But um, <clears throat> even if you switch from a toxic wheat, there's there's enough of a genetic crossover where you, where it's still going to de destroy your gut so get rid of that sugar would be a third one okay so every pathological thing feeds off of sugar corn wheat sugar yep. the three and, first and, three. and on top of that get yourself a clean water supply the zero water pitchers as i said it's hands down they would they every independent lab shows him taking the most most of the toxins out of there. And Aquasan is a great whole house system. If you want uh, a distiller, a steam distiller will give you the cleanest water you can possibly have. So now um, in, in the event that folks want to get in touch with you first, uh, share with us uh, the title of your book and where it can be found. And then uh, please let folks know where they can get in touch with you. Okay, title of the book is Exposing Lyme and Chronic Illness, Revealing the Hidden Secrets That Keep You Sick. Um, that book and the way to get a hold of us is probably the same place is probably the best one. Our website is healthfullyu.com. That's the letter U, not Y-O-U. So it's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-L-Y you.com and with that there's a ton of videos on there there's a lot of resources on that website and <clears throat> dr brad we, we thank you for all the great work you're doing for the live community the resources on your website and the work that you're you're doing in the social media community and we thank you so much for taking time away from your from your busy practice and from your family to uh share all of this great information with us here at tick boot camp yeah, well, thanks for having me. I, I I think that was really, really enjoyable. It, it was certainly enjoyable for me, and I know folks in our community are going to love, uh, love this podcast. So thank you very much. All right, you're welcome.